Hey everyone, Jeff Marion here, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. I um, want to take a little bit of a different approach, and I decided I had a little more to say about the 3M Combat earplugs litigation that I didn't get to in my recent video. So I wanted to spend a little time with you and go over a couple of more issues that you should be aware of in some detail so that you're filled in on every aspect of this litigation. Uh, changed up a little bit, I sort of torqued my knee. Um, it's fine, I just have to kind of ice it and heal it up. So I'm in a sitting position and I kind of turn things around here. Um, so I hope you're not thrown off by the setup here. Um, as you know, I put these videos together to help you understand personal injury law. I also do videos that include advice on how to deal with a car crash, like this video. So check out my videos on other topics or check out the playlist on 3M Combat Earplugs. Subscribe to this channel by clicking on the subscribe button and then click on the bell to make sure that you get notifications when we have new videos. So what I wanna talk about with you is uh, two things. I kind of referred to the appeal that's going on and I gave you a real brief overview uh, that there was an appeal and that there were appeals from the first cases, the first bellwether trials. Well, there's a couple of important issues and one major issue that we should go over. Um, I talked a little bit about the government contractor defense. Um, I wanted to go into that in a little more detail for you so you understand it, because it's a complicated kind of, kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? A complicated term and a complicated legal theory. So the government contractor defense that 3M is raising is that, hey, we made these earplugs to your specifications department of defense. We didn't come to you with these. This is what you told us to manufacture and this is what we did. So what that does is allows 3M, if they are considered a government contractor, to ask for a uh, preemption of any claims. What do I mean by preemption? Now, generally speaking, preemption, and believe me, there are pages upon pages of law review articles written by professors at some of the biggest law schools in the country that describe and go into very deep detail about preemption. Um, I don't want to do that here because I guarantee that you will start to feel your eyes get heavy and you will move on to like a cat video or something like that. So let me try to explain preemption in very basic terms. The main theory of liability, if you have a case in this 3M combat earplug litigation, is based on your own state's product liability law. The major ones being a breach of warranty of use and uh, strict product liability, putting a defective product out into the market. Now, breach of warranty means essentially if I sell you an earplug, that I warrant to you that the earplug will actually prevent hearing loss. If it doesn't do that, that's a breach of warranty. Those causes of action are generally governed by state law. So whatever state you live in, essentially if you're filing in this 3M combat earplug litigation, we're really deciding a federal case under state law or a case in federal court under state law. Preemption kicks in to say, hey, where there is a federal statute or regulation that supersedes the state law, then the federal regulation or federal law takes precedent and preempts the state claim, which means you have to dismiss it. So the government contractor defense essentially says, look, as a government contractor acting at the behest of the government and making the product on their specs, that government contractor and the rules guard and regulations, uh, the rules and regulations governing government contractors are federal and preempt the state product liability claim. Okay, so what does all that mean? I hope that that was explained in plain English. I tried my best. Uh, 
this is where you leave something in the comments. Say, you know, once again, Jeff, in English, say something or explain that. But the rub of the whole thing is that if the court says that there's federal preemption, that means that these product liability claims are dismissed. You got to pursue against the Department of Defense, which as a soldier, you cannot sue the Department of Defense under the Ferris Doctrine, F-E-R-E-S. It's a Supreme Court case that says that you can't sue the Department of Defense if you are in, in the service uh, for any form of negligence. There is an exception to that rule, that Ferris Doctrine, but that only applies in medical negligence cases. So that's something you got to be aware of. So what happened is that the defense did make this motion to dismiss everything at the outset of the case. Now, Judge Rogers, who was handling this claim in the Northern District of Florida, wrote a lengthy opinion. Most federal judges and their clerks will write lengthy and detailed federal opinions in their decision. And what they'll do is cite as many cases that they apply to the facts before them and say, okay, based on these cases, we find that the preemption claim doesn't lie. They're not a government contractor, which is really the argument that the plaintiffs have been making all along is that basically 3M knew about their design, made the design themselves, purchased the design from Aero Technologies, sold this defective product to the Department of Defense, knowing it was defective, failing to warn uh, the, of the problem, and therefore they are liable. So this is a big portion of their appeal, and this is something that defense attorneys for 3M and Aero Technologies have talked about at length in the press. What they say is that because these cases should have been dismissed at the outset, this whole thing has gotten out of hand. Now another portion and other issues in the appeal, that's not the only thing they're appealing to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. They are also making Daubert motions. Now what a Daubert motion is, is to exclude an expert from the plaintiff's side. And that's using uh, the uh, Daubert case, Daubert versus Merrill Dow Pharmaceutical. It's a Supreme Court of the United States. And it sets the standard for when someone is qualified as an expert. I won't get into that there. If you look up Daubert, D-A-U-B-E-R-T, there are probably law professors, there's probably other channels that will explain that to you or just make your head spin. To make it easy, essentially you have to meet this Daubert standard. Your experts have to show that their work and their conclusions are based on proper science, accepted science, accepted methodologies, uh, accepted practices, long and the short of it. Um, so there's always Daubert motions. A lot of these motions were denied uh, for plaintiffs, witnesses, plaintiffs experts, and there were several defense experts that were knocked out of the box on Daubert. So they have also decided to uh, appeal those issues. Now, if the 11th Circuit were to rule that Judge Rogers made an error and should have either allowed or disallowed a certain expert, that can lead to new trials. What the 11th Circuit would do is say, okay, well, we remand for a new trial. So this could start the whole thing back to square one. What happens if uh, the plaintiffs win on all of these arguments? Again, what I would say to you is, despite where the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals is, that the judges tend to be at the federal level a little more conservative, a little more pro-business, it's not like um, Judge Rogers like threw darts at a board and said, okay, this is how we're going to do it. Um, her opinions, and if you want to go through, if you have time, you can start to go through and you can look for decisions and orders that she's written. And you can see uh, she's a very good writer and she really lays out all of her opinions with a lot of case site authority uh, to back up her claims. So uh, her decisions are very reasoned and I think the 11th Circuit may have a very hard time overruling. Now there's two things that can happen. There's two sort of levels of appeal. Normally in the Federal District, Federal Circuit Court of Appeals, 
you'll get three judges on a panel and they'll write a decision. If you don't like their decision, you can ask for an en banc hearing. Um, what that means is uh, you get the entire, all of the judges that are appointed to that court will then hear the case and then they'll make a determination. After that point, if the defendants don't like what's happening, they can appeal to the United States Supreme Court. Now, the Supreme Court doesn't take every appeal. They grant what they call certiorari, in other words, a writ to appear before them and make arguments, and they do it for about 90 to 100 cases a year. Now, bear in mind, there are tens of thousands of cases that are filed at the Supreme Court of the United States every year. So who knows if they will actually grant certiorari to hear the case or whether they will simply send it back, say, certiorari denied, and then you're stuck with the decision or we live with the decision from the 11th Circuit. Now, the second thing I wanted to talk about here in a little bit more detail was some of the side issues. The one big thing is, again, that DD-214. So if you're just getting your case going now, make sure that when you meet with your lawyer that you have your DD-214 available, or if you're meeting with a lawyer uh, on Zoom or uh, some other uh, you know, virtual method, that you email or electronic fax a copy of your DD-214 to, uh, to that lawyer so that they have it. The reason that the judge is asking for the DD-214 and they're asking that the DD-214 be filed within 14 days of filing a summons and complaint in the case uh, is to basically start to weed out because there's a window from about 2003 to 2014 where these cases, uh, where the use of the earplugs, excuse me, uh, was common. So that's kind of the window that they're looking at, 2003 to 2014, 2015, maybe a little bit longer. If your service isn't within that window, your case is likely to be rejected uh, at some point. So make sure that you have it, get a copy of it. Also, the federal government has stopped responding to requests uh, by the court to obtain military records of the various plaintiffs. So you're going to have to do your own search for your own military records. Um, there are some links that are available. If I can find them, I'll throw them in the comments section so you can use them if you need to search for your, uh, search for your uh, records. It's only after you have failed on those two or three attempts and there's two or three different links that the government will consider, the, the court will step in to say, turn over the records. Um, but again, with 300,000 cases, it's going to be very hard for the Department of Defense to really keep up with the uh, backlog of requests. Um, some orders came out and they were on the Daubert motions that I talked about. In other words, the admiss admissibility of experts and their testimony. And one of the things that the defense is raising and trying to get testimony on is other causes for tinnitus especially. Um, big ones are uh, TMJ where you have a, you know, strike struck in the jaw, your jaw is dislocated, um, uh, the mandible bone is somehow damaged and that can uh, cause problems in your ears, ringing in your ears. Usually happens like in an assault, uh, in a crash, um, or some other blunt trauma to the head. So they're going to be arguing that if you had TMJ, um, then what you're going to want to do, what that is, is that's really the cause of it, not the use of the earplugs. So uh, your attorney should be asking about that. If you have had issues with that in the past, please raise them with your attorney uh, because that's going to be important in screening your case as to whether you can go forward. Um, that's the situation where the doctor says, well, you got the tinnitus from a car crash. So that may be something, and that's something that uh, you're going to want to go into detail with your attorney about. The other thing they're trying to do is claim a traumatic brain injury 
and that's actually a symptom of the traumatic brain injury and not uh, hearing damage. So if you do suffer from a traumatic brain injury, something that you do need to be aware of is, and you need to be clear in your medical records, that the tinnitus may be predated it, you were having problems with it before the brain injury happened, um, and that you can point to uh, the use of the earplugs. So that's another defense that's flying around out there. So these are things that you've got to be aware of because they're going to try to find other ways and other incidents where you've got tinnitus. Who knows? They might even say COVID-19 causes tinnitus, and if you had COVID-19, that's where your tinnitus came from. So make sure that with your doctors that they rule out everything except everything except hearing damage. They say, look, it's definitely hearing damage. It's got nothing to do with concussion. It's got nothing to do with head trauma. It's got nothing to do uh, with TBI or any of that. So I hope you don't mind the little change in format here. Uh, I'm just kind of throwing this on, and I wanted to get it out to you. So it's going to be pretty... Uh, straightforward and there's not going to be much editing to it uh, but I did want to pass along that information and I hope I, I, I simplified it for you because these are complex legal issues but they do affect the outcome of these cases so uh, I do want to thank all of you who've been watching these videos who've been subscribing uh, to the channel who've been commenting uh, and asking questions and the questions are great uh, I really appreciate them. I really appreciate you guys and girls taking the time uh, to watch these videos, to comment on them, and to uh, send your questions to me and put your trust in me for um, some uh, update on, these, on this litigation. So, in conclusion, thanks again for watching this video. Um, please, if you found this helpful, click on the like button. Click on the subscribe button so you get notifications when new videos come out. Make sure you click on that bell. That sends you additional notifications. Um, and I will continue to do these videos as long as there are bellwether trials, as long as this litigation is moving forward. So thanks again, guys and girls. Um, thank you so much. And I will see you in the next video.